Okay, hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, so, sorry, I'm a little bit nervous. Um, I am one of the new PhD students that is starting this October. So a lot of you have probably never met me nor heard of me. As I've been introduced, my name is Melissa. My pronouns are she, they, and I'm here to present my paper and presentation on the performance of gender at LARP. I will be examining the performance of LARP um, of gender at LARP by using the FEST LARP Curious Pastimes as a case study. Let me just move that up there. I myself am a player within this system and have opted to largely explore the subject of gender in this game through my personal experiences in and the experiences of some of my close companions. There will be a focus on gender identities that fall under the transgender umbrella, such as non-binary, agender, and gender fluid identities. Though I'll also briefly examine the overall balance of gender in Curious Pastimes and the subject of inclusivity in the system. So, what is LARP? Well, for those of you that aren't too familiar with the subject, LARP is the acronym that we use in place of live action role play. To put it simply, a live action role play system is an analog game where people from everyday life flock towards a predetermined location. Sometimes this can be a scout camp or a forest. Sometimes it's an actual building such as a manor or a school. When there, they don new personas and play in a world of fantasy. Those familiar with tabletop games like Dungeons and Dragons, to use a popular example, may find it easier to imagine LARPing as playing Dungeons and Dragons in real time, where you become your character and the story unfolds around you. The decisions you make mean something, but you are not bound by the societal norms of daily life. Laws are different and expression of self is often freer and wonderfully creative. Furthermore, discrimination is heavily frowned upon and players are protected by their faction, its leaders and the surrounding game team and referees. If a player is upset by something, they can dispute it. And it's very normal for heavily emotional scenes or scenes that may be distressing or contain distressing themes to be discussed before they're acted out. This does not interfere with the game. It's an out of character conversation to ensure that everybody is comfortable. Here in this image, you'll spot my own character in the midst of a battle that took place in May this year. It's a very recent photo. They identify as agender and use she, they pronouns. Whereas myself, I'm non-binary and use she, they pronouns. I have provided alt text on the screen, but I will also read any alt text aloud to describe the images in this presentation. So the alt text here is a silver haired femme presenting elf swinging two swords towards a male human crouching down behind a small shield, while another man tries to attack her with his own sword and a spear comes towards her from the left. In the background, there are human characters looking into the distance. The bottom of the photo reads Weekend Heroes in red text, who are the photographer who took this image. Copyright Weekend Heroes. I can tell you that the next image in this series involves me on the ground. That's what happens in LARP when you don't have backup and are fighting three people. About Curious Pastimes. Curious Pastimes is one of England's largest LARP games and communities, with hundreds of players attending each mainline event every LARP season. I believe there were just over a thousand players at the fourth and final mainline event of 2019. It is a high fantasy festival style game that has been running almost every year since 1996, showcasing over 20 years of heroes and their stories. Festival style LARP games, also known as Fest LARPs, are large scale live action role play games that usually take place in a field where players can camp in or out of character. There's some plot that is continued throughout the year and some may even be brought forward from faction events. So this is typically fairly minor compared to the overall world plot. These smaller events are run during the off season, that being the time between the main events. So if Curious Pastimes, they run their main events May, June, July, and August. So 
the rest of the year, you can typically see a few faction events from each faction. Although these are very much smaller events and you would typically see about 60 players at them at the most. Alt text, the words curious pastimes written in white on a black background with a red line separating the words. Copyright curious pastimes. Character creation. Unlike the video games of the last few decades, the gender of your character is chosen by you at character creation. There is no rule that forces you into one role or another, and the limits of your gender assignment, as far as popular game curious pastimes is concerned, doesn't exist. Your identity is just that, your identity. You can become as mighty as a faction leader or as flighty as a sketchy merchant, and your gender will not limit the choices you make or the story you write for yourself in the game. To paraphrase Aaron Trammell from his work, The Trouble with Gender in LARP, non-normative gender expressions and sexualities can, can create a break in the expectations of other players. This can become a source of dispute when players hold onto the expectations that they have from everyday life. Instead, what LARP designers and organizers allow players to do is choose the genders of their characters without, their own, without interference from the overall game. This gender neutral LARP design offers players the opportunity to perform gender through their character, even though their character's gender may differ from their own. We must ask ourselves then, how do the roles of gender in society differ from gender being performed at LARP? Alt text, a large group of players dressed as their characters, many holding spears and wearing armor, waiting to walk into battle. Copyright Chase the Storm, Peter Scott Photography. The social construct of gender and gender roles. The social construct of gender is a theory about gender perception and expression within social interaction. As Linda L. Lindsay explains in her book, Gender Roles, gender roles are the expected attitudes and behaviors a society associates with each sex. A role is the expected behavior associated with a status. Roles are performed according to those social norms, that, that, that being shared rules that guide people's behavior in specific situations. Women, as an example, were often expected to be available at given times to satisfy the needs of family and workplace. But because social institutions have not been modified in meaningful ways to account for the new st statuses that women occupy, their range of acceptable role behavior is severely restricted. It is thought to be a woman's role to be soft and domestic, while a man must be emotionless and hardworking. The social construct that is gender is extremely lim limiting. Society has tried to limit gender into boxes labeled male and female, and that brings about a number of oversimplified stereotypes that are used to justify discrimination against members of a given group. However, as more gender identities are recognized and more individuals are true to themselves, the boxes that society forces on us become uninhabitable. Gender becomes something that we force ourselves to perform to please others, while we actually wish to perform our true selves out in the world. And this is where LARP comes in. Alt text, a femme presenting elf with silver hair and three red strikes down her cheek kisses the hand of a femme presenting ginger haired elf wearing a flower crown while there are trees in the background and sunlight filters through. Copyright, Joel Wiley. Performing yourself in LARP. In her essay, Performing the Real, Lizzie Stark explains becoming your character not as becoming another person, but as performing that person's life through connecting them to yourself. She says, by necessity, you spin a character out of the stuff that makes up your own soul. She had to recognize the shared humanity between her character and herself. And in doing so, she connected with other parts of her personality. As she says, we are ourselves, but different. LARP allows us to take a facet of ourselves or even create a new part of ourselves entirely and put it out into the world. It can be from the tiniest daydream of you, 
plucked from a make-believe memory, thought up when you're reading or talking to friends, or even looking back on history and just wondering what it would have been like. Wherever it comes from, playing in a LARP system gives you a space to explore that piece that would otherwise be ignored. Here you can see two images. These are the same individual. On the left, alt text, a female human in a green dress smiling as she poses for the image, copyright Oliver Facey. And on the right, alt text, a non-binary elven character sitting at a table in a large tent with a soft glow of candles lighting the area. They wear multiple layers and a scarf is wrapped around their neck. Copyright, Agent B Smith Photography, Ben Smith. The individual in question is truer to their own gender identity in the second image. In their life, they identify as non-binary and this character of theirs identifies the same. But the first image is them performing and identifying as a female character. Performing a character's gender. Performing a character's gender is no different from performing your own, but LARPers can find it more difficult to perform a gender that they don't identify with for a number of reasons. Part of this can be because of the phenomenon known as bleed in, where the emotions, thoughts, relationship dynamics, and physical states of the character can affect the, sorry, physical states of the player can affect the character they're playing. An individual performing an unfamiliar gender identity may accidentally refer back to their personal gender identity out of familiarity or out of comfort, particularly in high stress situations. It can, of course, also happen out of sheer forgetfulness. The majority of LARPers will not consider their character's gender beyond their own, but for those who identify outside of the gender binary of male and female, I have observed that they do consider their character's gender more closely. Alt text, a character with human, reptile and bird features expresses their distaste by squishing up their nose and squinting at their eyes. They have short, split green and blue hair, green and dark blue facial markings, and are wearing a capelet of black green feathers a beaded necklace hangs from their neck copyright Oliver Facey exploring gender identity through a character playing games of make-believe inevitably allow questioning players to explore their gender identity through their character LARPers spend large periods of time over several weekends of the year physically and mentally performing their character's identity and often their characters will evolve with them. How can you not when you spend so much time emotionally invested in this part of yourself? Going back to Lizzie Stark, going back to Lizzie's, Lizzie Stark's idea of creating a character out of what makes up your own person, it's not unrealistic to say that what makes up your character can also become part of you. You are, after all, playing with unexplored elements of yourself. In a world of fantasy, the chance to be more than your present self is all too enticing. An example here is a good friend of mine in the two images you see on the screen. Alt text, close up of a male character wearing a wool poncho with the hood on his head. Black face paint surrounds his eyes as he looks off into the distance. Copyright, Steve Mitchell. And the second image, alt text, close up of the same character three years later, wearing light green face paint around his eyes. A flower crown of white and yellow roses sits on his head, while the background is a blurred area of one of the tents in the faction camp. Copyright Agent B Smith Photography, Ben Smith. In the years between these images, as he continued to play his character, he also brought his character's experiences with gender back into his own life. LARP became a space where he could safely explore his gender identity, breaking away from more masculine stereotypes and allowing himself the chance to push at the limits placed on him by society's gender roles. Curious pastimes and gender inclusion. Gender inclusion within the Curious Pastimes system is constantly being worked on. In the first event I attended back in 2019, one of the occurrences that has stuck with me was the new player briefing. Before heading into the talk on combat rules and what to do when you get hit, 
the members of the game team heading that meeting took the time to tell us all that we should not assume another player's gender and that using gender neutral pronouns until you're properly introduced is the best way to go about LARPing in, well, a decent way. It was expected of us to use gender neutral pronouns until we found out the other players preferred pronouns. There is also a wonderful lack of gendered language in the rule book with just one instance where the terms male and female are used. The text in question refers to the physical difference between male and female dwarves, stating that all male dwarves sport a beard, but not stubble, while female dwarves generally do not have beards. Further, players are not stereotyped or stuck in roles because of their perceived gender. Algaia, a faction within the game, is led by a woman. Teutonia, another faction, has just achieved an all-femme presenting team of leaders in their camp. Of the head scouts that lead each faction's scouting missions, there is an equal split between femme and mask presenting individuals. Algaia's head scout is non-binary out of character and agender in character, and they are just as respected as any other head scout, and though most of their scouting team is male or mask presenting, they await her orders just as readily as they waited for the previous male head scout's orders. I know this because I am Alkaya's current head scout. A recent victory for non-binary players happened during the only mainline event of 2021. Algaia introduced a third deity. Where the faction previously worshipped the goddess as a female presenting figure and the hunter as a male presenting figure, we now have the forgeborn, who is referred to with gender neutral pronouns and who does not present as male or female. They have no discernible features, for they wear a gold mask to cover their face and cover most of their body in cloth and armour. Alt text. A group of players in a ritual circle kneel before a masked deity with no female or male features. Their body is covered in dark cloth and spiked armour protects their right arm. In their right hand is a large hammer. Copyright Oliver Facey. Advancing gender exploration and gender visibility through LARP. Alt text, a green toned image of a femme presenting dwarf wearing loose clothing and carrying a hammer as she walks away from her camp. Behind her is the banner for Curious Pastimes faction Algaia and several players talking in groups near tents. Copyright Weekend Heroes. Why is all of this important? Well, by enabling players to have full control over the gender identity of their characters, Curious Pastimes provides an open space in another society where players can explore gender without the pressures of the outside world. In a game of fantasy, the only prejudices are the ones that players bring with them from outside the game, which is heavily frowned upon. We are told not to do this. It is a different world and the prejudices that exist in our daily life do not exist in these fantasy worlds as far as gender is concerned. In fact, there have been several post-game announcements from inside factions and online about gender equality and discrimination, where players who observe this type of negative behavior have been offered a safe way to communicate with the wider game team to report such events. Away from outside prejudices, we can see a clear impact on how having a place to explore gender helps players in their daily lives. They are given a place to freely express themselves knowing that they have the support of a huge number of other players and the game team of the system, which enables them to spend time exploring and considering their gender and their own gender identity while in and out of character. This sometimes leads to developments in their character as well as changes in their own lives. I am proud to be one such player who used LARP to further explore their gender identity. And I know many other players who have done the same. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa, for a lovely presentation, a great talk. Um, we have had some questions, but unless uh, you have any desperate need to uh, leave the Zoom call or anything like that, I'm going to hold all questions for all of the talks so that we can all get a chance to address them uh, as a panel, because I think some of them will have um, a lot of pertinence cross talk. Um, but if you have any immediate thoughts based on the uh, comments in the chat, do feel free to jump in um, and hopefully we should have plenty of time uh, collectively to address all of the questions. But are there any points you wanted to raise before we move on to the next uh, speakers?
uh, we have specifically had questions asking about the comparison between LARP and tabletop role playing, um, the use of pronoun badges and the sort of interface between uh, the performance of gender and performing non-human characters. So as I say, I think this will have relevance across the presentations. Um, so thank you uh, for all of the questions so far. Um, and. Uh, it will be a little bit uh, challenging for me to address the next uh, set of questions, um, as I'll also be participating in giving the next presentation along with uh, my colleagues, Chris Lam and Lorraine McKee. Um, so we'll be uh, presenting, oh, thank you, Chloe is going to keep an eye on the questions for us. Um, so we'll be presenting our uh, sort of perspectives on what it's been like uh, designing uh, LARP uh, in the context of running games that are focused on a, a pre-apocalyptic or end of the world scenario. Um, so if you'll just bear with me a moment and I will uh, make my screen visible for you. Okay. Uh, so as there are uh, three of us on this panel, um, hopefully uh, you will be able to hear us all while also viewing the slides. Um, do shout out in the chat if there are any issues with the slides not advancing, as I know that is sometimes a technical problem that I've had when presenting on Zoom previously. Um, I'd like to invite my co-presenters, uh, Christopher Lamb and Lorraine McKee, to introduce themselves and just say a little bit about who they are. Um, I'm just, uh, my name's Lorraine. I'm just currently um, dealing with a, a background issue. Um, I LARP online and um, <laughs> I've left my character's LARP background on. So I'm dealing with that. Um, I, I'm, uh, I've been LARPing for many, many years um, uh, since uh, probably 2006, November 2006. Um, and uh, I've done a variety of systems, both as staff and as a player. Um, and of course, I'm on the before the end team. Thanks, Lorraine. Lorraine is also um, professionally an ecologist, which is something that we draw on in terms of her expertise extensively. Um, <laughs> Chris, do you want to just say a little bit about yourself? Chris? <laughs> we we I, we can see you talking, but the well, volume isn't coming through, Chris. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Thank you. That's okay. I was actually quite worried. I'd spoken over Lorraine at one point, so I'm very glad to hear that's not the case. Um, hello, my name is Chris Lamb. My pronouns are they them. Um, I'm the main sort of head up of Reality Checkpoint LARP, of which before the end, which we're going to be discussing about, is one of the LARPs that we run. Uh, my background is that I predominantly have previously written for festival size LARPs, which Melissa has spoken for, and was in charge of storytelling for the Laurian Trust system for about two years. Um, in terms of my background, which is uh, far less interesting than ecology, I'm actually a lawyer in my day to day life, and I find that writing and doing LARPs is a great way to get from all the paperwork and doing something a little bit more interesting and exciting. Uh, thanks, Chris. Um, so uh, Chloe has already introduced me. I am a lecturer. I'm actually a lecturer in a management school. My specialization is business ethics, but I have also been a LARPer since 2002. Um, and I've uh, been involved in organizing and writing LARP uh, probably since around about 2006 uh, and have written about this in an academic capacity as well. My pronouns are she, her. Um, so. Uh, in the background of our slides, there are some images throughout the entire presentation. I will describe them as we go through. Um, and they are all attributable, I believe, uh, either to Oliver Facey, uh, copyright wise, um, or to Winterpecht Photography. 
Um, so before the end is a uh, system that really uh, is Chris's uh, sort of inspiration that we would engage in uh, delivering LARP experiences uh, that sort of drew on the concept of an anthology. Now, Horror LARP, if you are not already aware, uh, often operates uh, unlike Fest LARP. Uh, by sort of single standalone events. So people will play one event as a, a specific character. There will not be continuity between that event and any other event. It will be a one-off uh, sort of one-shot game. Um, we do not have the same model as that. So we have an anthology system. Um, and Before the End uh, was originally designed by Chris to have six episodes, a bit like a TV series. So Chris, could you just talk us through very briefly um, what the events were that we've done so far? Absolutely. So as Laura's mentioned, we wanted to go for an anthology LARP series, uh, very similar to a TV show like Black Mirror or The Twilight Zone, where our attendees would come along and play a different character at each event, but they'd be able to see underlying Easter eggs or common themes and topics throughout each episode or event, as it were. And so from starting in 2016, we did our first event, which is our smallest, known as Press Conference. And in each of these, we tried to keep it fairly simple. It's a very mundane event turned horribly wrong. And so what we went with for event one was, it's a press conference. There is currently a famine taking place over the United Kingdom. And you are members of the press, ministers, journalists, scientists, who have all come to a press conference to discuss how is this disaster going to be handled. What we weren't going to tell our players, and suddenly they found out, was the Prime Minister dies on Friday night of the event. They come across his body, and this heralds the beginning of what can only be described as a biblical style apocalypse. That famine being just one prelude to terrible things to come. And as demons and angels walk the earth, you have anyone from spin doctors to ministers all having to reflect on the decisions that they made during their life and what the consequences will be for them in this new world going forward. And then almost as a tonal whiplash, a year later, we decided to do All Stars. And with All Stars, what we wanted to do was the reality television show at the end of the world. I, I had a job interview a few years ago where at that job interview, me and a group of interviewees had a group task, which was there's a bunker. You have 10 people, but only spaces for five and the world is about to end. Pick who is going to be in that bunker to inherit the world to come. Isn't that a reality TV show in its own way, waiting to see which of those people deserve a place? Are those skills that they have going to be applicable for the end of the world? And what we had was we had a, a venue which was very similar to a warehouse. We built it up like a TV set, but with underlying back alleys and ventilation shafts. And as the nuclear apocalypse out happened outside the bunker, our players, who were all a mixture of reality TV shows, stars or producers and directors, had to make the decision as to who would be able to survive and who would be asked to leave the house. That then led us on to Paradise Falls in 2018, in which a writer's camp at the end of the world in a Stephen King S style story of small hometown America, players playing members of the writer who had died, uh, their family, their friends, or simply people who lived locally in the town who knew her, all arriving on the basis that there was a mysterious manuscript, apparently a long lost book that they were to look for. Little knowing that this long lost book and indeed all the series of novels that have been written had an underlying message of something terrible that this author had committed or had done. And as the pandemic began to quickly and rapidly engulf the rest of the world, they had to decide how they would handle the information that they came to them that was tied directly to this end of the world event. And then finally, for event four, which is our last event in 2019 before sort of the 2020 pandemic, uh, we wanted to do, at least personally, a, a good old fashioned kind of B-movie plot line. Um, a number of people have been taken hostage by a terrorist organisation in a far off you know, for, uh, fictional country. And all of a sudden, members of the uh, sort of SWAT teams and things are coming in to save them. Little knowing that a meteor is approaching the Earth and the alien technology that is scattered around this unknown location could be what is there to save them. Very much a predator s storyline mixed with a meteor coming. We wanted to be a bit more B-movie-esque. But all of these have had very, very different tones, very different styles, but with that underlying theme of, you know, humanity, survival, and what characters will do with the final hours that are coming for them. And hopefully we're looking to do events five and event six, now that the world is starting to open up a bit more, starting hopefully with a New Year's party at uh, 1999 for event five. So a bit different, uh, but that's before the end so far, as it were. 
Thanks, Chris. Um, so uh, generally speaking, I think we've uh, already had in our previous presenter an excellent introduction to what LARP is. Um, so I'll sort of run through this a little bit more quickly than perhaps otherwise I would have done. Um, uh, in 2016, I did publish an article um, about LARP and uses of the countryside. Um, and in order to do that, this was the definition I came up with at the time, uh, which I think is sort of more broadly applicable outside of FEST systems. So live action role play is a leisure pursuit, quite specifically, based upon the acting out of an improvised narrative in the context of a particular setting or genre. Participants come together in a particular location for a limited time to act out an improvised costume drama, often in a carefully designed scenario and setting with minimum direct guidance. Now, I am aware that there are some people who are LARP designers who might disagree with that last point, but um, it's quite important to us on BTE. So what is uh, sort of crucial to us when it comes to thinking about design of a LARP or developing a LARP? So size matters. Um, we have a certain number of players that we consider ideal um, and we don't really want to go beyond that. We have discovered from previous experience that their horror genres generally, if you watch horror movies, if you read horror novels, you tend not to have a very large group of characters. Um, so we wanted to keep our uh, events relatively small, but while also allowing for um, as many people to take part as was possible. So we tend to have a maximum capacity of about 40 to 50. Um, we also feel quite strongly that genre matters uh, when it comes to LARP design. Uh, fantasy LARP, people expect to play heroes a lot of the time. They expect to be able to uh, climb the castle, save the princess, defeat the monsters. When drawing on other genres such as science fiction, um, historical fiction or horror, we think these uh, have slightly different impacts on the design features of our game. Um, and so we have reflected quite extensively on how that impacts on the exact theme that we use. And finally, we feel quite strongly that uh, LARP games, particularly in a UK setting, privilege player autonomy. Um, with a minimum guidance or direction uh, from the game organizing team. There is a lot of tension in that question of autonomy because you can't just simply have players do absolutely anything under the sun while still maintaining a consistent narrative. So we have a range of different um, procedures and uh, sort of techniques that we use to sort of facilitate that autonomy, including a game system, um, as well as a, a very much a developed culture of what constitutes sort of acceptable behavior in the game world and around the game. Um, so on your screens, you will see an image just at the moment of uh, a small group of people uh, lit with torches in a sort of fantasy setting. And I just wanted to contrast that image with the sort of things that we will be doing in our future games and things that we do in our games now. Uh, LARP is playing pretend on a grand scale. It is more than uh, the three people that you see in this image. Um, and you'll see that two of our presenters are in this image. Uh, Lorraine is threatening Chris in character with uh, a gun. Um, they are dressed in tweed. And I understand the characters in this particular game were inspired uh, very much from the Sherlock Holmes novels. But the thing is, as well as games having participant limits, we also have to address explicit and implicit limits on accessibility and inclusion. Our events, uh, for the most part, unlike many fest events, are not always fully public. Um, so one of the things that I would like us to talk about a little bit is how we recruit people into our events uh, from the very beginning. 
Um, so I will skip through uh, some of the other images just to explain and give you an overview. Uh, I have here an image from event one, um, which shows uh, a rather old building that could resemble a chapel and a small group of people, uh, predominantly in uh, smart business wear, sitting on an eclectic collection of chairs in front of a lectern. Um, and it's lit by a small lamp in the corner of the room. On this next image, which is from event three, which we'll talk about uh, in more detail, you can see a group of people in contemporary outdoor clothing in a forested setting uh, around congregated at night around uh, an American flag on a flagpole. Um, and some of the individuals in the foreground appear to be looking somewhat mysterious. There's one person robed in a white cloak. Um, so uh, some of our principles of LARP design in Before the End uh, are constrained by uh, pragmatic features. Games last around 36 hours. So in that time, our players have bodily needs. Uh, we have to address the fact that they need to eat, sleep, and visit bathroom at least some time uh, during that period. We don't have winners, we have survivors, and consequently that provokes people into a particular kind of emotional frame of mind. But fairness is important in how we recruit people into the games and how we administer the games. So our games are managed by six designated character referees, of which three of us are here today. Um, we have progressed from how we issue our tickets uh, to a lottery system, as we have now found that we have more demand for uh, players' spots in our games uh, than we have places available. And we have quite a complex character creation process, which allows players to uh, communicate with each other and sort of co-create their narratives um, focused on thematic groups with the game team prior to the beginning of the game. We have a, a system that is broadly inspired by some of the uh, sort of sanity systems you find in Cthulhu style horror games. Um, but in our system, it's a clarity system, um, which is mainly to sort of focus on how players are able, to, how well players are able to concentrate under the current traumatic conditions. Um, and they have a, a small bag of marbles to physically sort of use to manifest that. Um, and we have a complex uh, system for uh, refereeing any combative conflict in game around things like the use of guns um, or the use of physical weaponry and how people might execute one another um, if they are very much caught at the end of the world with only one place left in the bunker. So we aim to engage the player community um, and we also aim to allow them to play the game in the way that they see fit. Um, and Lorraine has uh, really been quite instrumental in this. So I wonder if you could uh, explain a little bit more, Lorraine, about uh, some of the issues around that. Um, uh, well, so just to pick up on a, a couple of points on this particular slide, when we say we have survivors, that doesn't mean they're winners either. Just to just to lay that out there, um, we we are running modern horror, and it can be quite uh, nihilistic. Um, we we do engage the player community as well. Um, so when we say that, um, we we are aware that people, everybody, every single person has a trauma, has some kind of trauma in their past. We don't want to trigger somebody to have an out of character bad time an out of character negative reaction um so we are very careful to kind of ask people and we never ask can we have the specifics but we do say do you have any phobias or do you have any situations you'd be uncomfortable role playing and um, for me personally um i i am a person who has is currently in cbt for neil phobia so at the uh, the event where we had the medical themes, uh, we were all given wristbands, uh, medical ones, and mine read nil by needle, and that's how we ensured the kind of safety um, that that we had there for for folk. Um, so as you can see there, um, Laura's kind of flipped up for us. Um, so we 
very much, and of course this was all pre-pandemic when we ran this, um, very much we have spoken about it as a game team and we've gone, well, I mean, I don't think we're ever going to run pandemic again because that would be very triggering for mm. a lot of folk, you know. Um, one minor detour is that an awful lot of our players did say that um, they felt that they had actually gained a level of education about what it's like, you know, um, during a pandemic from the game, uh, the face masks, the glass, uh, the gloves, uh, and alcohol hand gel, etc., and so forth. Those kind of themes. Um, can you pop it back, Laura? Because uh, yeah. sorry, I've, I've kind of lost where I was for a so moment just talking about those odds and bits. Um, so yeah, we we do survey them. Um, and we uh, we do want, we believe wholeheartedly in player agency. Like it's really important for people, for players to choose where the story goes. It's collaborative storytelling. So quite often in tabletop games, in, in role-playing games, you can have what's known as the, you know, the train, the, the train track, you've been um, railroaded. Um, and that means that the game player wants you to follow a certain narrative we very much step away from that and we want to the players to figure out how bad it can be um, or how good it can be and for some people they set their own win conditions within that so that might mean for one player um, their win condition isn't that their character survives it's that they have saved their friends by throwing themselves bodily on a hand grenade which we've seen at one event so um, you know that 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 kind of thing will happen and sometimes people make very interesting choices um, as part of that narrative so we do aim to have an, a very low impact um, on those players um, and we do sort of uh, think about the design each time as we move forwards what worked what didn't um, one of the reasons we have a uh, so, some LARPs have a more free rule set i.e rule of call cool. let's just agree this between us and they might have a policy about out of character let's not be awful to each other but they have no stats or no skills or what have you in game um our lap we saw a couple of uh, myself and uh chris both experienced an event where we kind of went there was no rule set here somebody wasn't cool about the rule of cool and we're potentially going to have pvp player versus player here well we need to make sure there's a framework for players to execute people players to hit people how many strikes a person going to take before they pass out what's fair um so that has been built into the game because we want to uh make sure that there is a level of fairness at the end of the world i mean out of character of course <laughs> of course <laughs> and i think that speaks to something else that's quite important actually in terms of uh, LARP has this uh, sort of community that has developed. Um, and as I think I may have said, our, uh, our players predominantly are already people who have played LARP before. They have played LARP in other systems and they often are familiar with the both collaborative and competitive modes of playing the game. Um, and when the game is competitive, when players do engage in conflict with each other, um, we feel that a rule system that allows them to do that in a sort of mechanical way, while it can detract in some ways from the storytelling aspect of the game, it also helps people feel less uncomfortable about those difficult uh, sort of negotiations. Whose character is going to suffer for this? Who's going to die in this encounter? Will this mean that my enjoyment of the game has ended? Um, and, and ensuring that that is part of the narrative of the end of the world as well. Um, and we have found that we have had a diversity of player expectations. Um, and something that uh, sort of has come up quite often is that some people that have tried one of our games, uh, and I particularly am referring to event one, we've had uh, one or two people who've played our games, spoken to us afterwards and said, this was an amazing game, but I hated it. I do not want to play this any of your future games, but I would love to help 
co-create them as an organizer or as a crew member because they appreciate and want to be involved in the storytelling but they struggle with being part of a narrative where they cannot be a heroic winner because that is not the emotional experience they want to go through and so in terms of reflecting on those player expectations we've had to sort of consider our entire pre-game process um, and we look at that from the very sort of start of issuing tickets um, we make the sort of broad overview of the game very clear um, when it comes to the sort of horror like Lorraine was pointing out with uh, needles and medical horror especially with event three we now have quite a sophisticated survey tool that we use a questionnaire that we use um, asking people to identify um, possible themes that they do not want to engage with so that we can maintain surprise. So our survey lists basically every theme we could imagine that might come up in a horror game from uh, uh, things to do with insects or a giant arachnophobic end of the world through to medical horror and body horror and all the rest. Um, and there are some subjects as well, which as a team we have identified, we do not want to build this into our game because we do not want to put our players through an emotionally traumatic experience that was unintended. Um, so I really am glad of the uh, keynote speaker uh, raising that in the first presentation. And as a, an addition, sorry to, to butt in for a moment there, Laura, uh, event three, we had a mental health first aider on site. Um, I'm now a mental health first aider myself. So we have that kind of facility available as well. And uh, my partner, David, who's also on the team is also a mental health first aider as well. Um, so we do take those uh, particular concerns extremely seriously. And just to sort of highlight some of the things that we have expressly excluded um, from topics that we will cover in game, that includes things like cancer, um, uh, incidents of miscarriage, uh, issues to do with clowns um, was something that came up after a previous game. Um, because these are sort of relatively common concerns that could have been something that our players have highlighted um, in their uh, authentic life experiences as being something that they don't feel comfortable addressing in the game. Um, so in before the end three, uh, we addressed uh, these particular themes of death and memorial with the author uh, who had died prior to the start of the game. Uh, we wanted to engage players with body horror and we also wanted to use the American setting um, and the notion of a military industrial complex to engage players in something of a culture shock. Um, in addition, we combined this with the sort of Stephen King-esque small town isolation theme um, and also some issues around religious fundamentalism. Um, so Chris, would you like to uh, cover this issue to do with culture shock? Uh, yes, uh, culture shock is always an interesting one when we were looking at this topic. Our first two events were set in the United Kingdom, and that means you approach it from very much. Most of our players are from the UK, and there's a sort of degree of familiarity. When it comes to culture shock, and we Lorraine is, is from America, was raised in America, we did have someone who could feedback and provide advice and guidance on what they might expect as a community centre or a hall. Culture shock is very simple. I think we all understand that constantly we receive in our news feed about the gun situation in the United States, but it's simply dropping things like posters on the wall, which advise people on what to do in an active shooter event. It's a very simple piece of horror because for us, we do not experience that. When we go to our universities, our school, we don't see a process for anything except maybe a fire emergency. But over there in the United States, it's quite a common thing. And that can cause a culture shock, especially when we are having members of our player base walking around with guns. Some of them are members of the local police force. They're entitled to carry guns. That means that you've got people out there suddenly dealing with, oh, someone has a gun, and this is a very real thing that could happen to me at any time here. I'm not safe. 
And that's an interesting culture shock that comes around. And there was an individual who was playing a character who was looking at this position as, OK, in the future, would I be coming to this place as a potential shooter? And that, again, is another degree of fear. It changes how people look at events and it brings about an existential horror. And that's something that we're quite keen to do is to look at horror as a broad remit and theme in these topics. It's not as simple as body horror. It's not quite as simple as Cthulhu or Eldritch horrors. Sometimes it's looking at the horror of day-to-day -day life and, and understanding what we can learn from it as attendees once we step out of the LARP, once the game is concluded, which is why it's so important that we have mental health first aiders and that we are, are as a team ready to support our players once the game comes to an end. Um. Thanks, Chris. Uh, I think that probably the next thing that I want to do uh, just before we finish our presentation is cover for people listening what horrible things we do do to players. So I'm just going to run through event three uh, very much in overview with a few highlights, uh, not in terms of the story that players were participating in, but to just kind of highlight what we actually put them through. Um, so first of all, this was an event that was on a, a site in the Midlands. So players had to drive there. They were camping in tents outdoors in October. Um, we provided them with food. All of the food was American themed. Um, it was very much Southern style food and we did have some comments from players uh, about that uh, after the game um, that really did not appreciate uh, the American diet. Um, so this was very small things like making people eat mashed sweet potato with uh, um, uh, marshmallows, marshmallows on top which was Lorraine's uh, and cinnamon sugar as American <laughs> consultant. She also horrifically made me make tea in a microwave. Um, <laughs> We woke players in the middle of the night uh, while they were camping. Uh, we did not allow them undisrupted sleep. Uh, we continued the game for uh, all through the night. Uh, they went to memorial services uh, for the dead author. Um, they had torchlight processions through the, the dark forests. Uh, some of our players who were engaged in rather covert operations were meeting people uh, in all kinds of odd places in the dark in the forest. So they were sneaking away and laying traps. Um, we had uh, a car that was uh, sort of posed on site to look like it had crashed. Um, we had a individual come running in with uh, physical makeup to look like he had a, a horrific infection and was almost dead. Come in, he ran in uh, and started, of course, coughing on people and touching people. Um, we then had uh, a lot of little envelopes that we gave people uh, in the morning that told them uh, whether they were having uh, a particular uh, unpleasant night in terms of their dreams. Uh, we had uh, some people arrive in military uniforms at speed with lots of noise uh, in a Land Rover um, who herded players into uh, one of the cabins, wouldn't tell them what was going on. At the same time, we had uh, a crew member who was broadcasting local radio uh, from our uh, crew room located elsewhere on site. So players were able to tune into this radio. They were able to phone particular numbers uh, to contact and send emails to contacts uh, who were all volunteers of ours uh, who were off site and who had information about what was happening in the game world and could respond to them about whether uh, they were safe and so on. And we actually, when it came to the radio broadcaster later on in the event, we did have her actually die on air. Um, we had uh, some people uh, who were not players, but we set them up to look like players among the player party um, who were then taken outside and beaten. Um, which uh, you may see in this uh, particular image, um, although I believe this was a player. We have an image of a player in a body bag. Um, we have an image of a player being threatened uh, with a, a military member of uh, the crew with a gun um, and a player who's wearing a rather large jacket where he had concealed items about his person um, being very sternly instructed 
to move away while people watched uh, with very worried expressions from inside. Um, as things progressed, we had uh, a number of players experiencing infection symptoms. We took them into a clinical setup on site. We set up a medical tent uh, and we had people in full medical gear, including scrubs and masks and visors, um, taking people away one at a time for tests um, and again, refusing to give people information about what was going on. Um, there were a number of uh, ways in which players could uh, excuse themselves from the game if they did feel it was getting too much. Um, and that's something that we do at the start of every game as a safety briefing. Um, and we do make sure that we always have safety refs available um, for that. Um, so although I'm sort of summarizing the rather traumatic experiences, and we did, I believe, have three players at very early hours in the morning hiding in bushes, uh, on site, uh, slowly dying. Um, we did have some survivors at this game, which is not uh, true of all games. Um, it, but that's, in general, what our game experience is like for players. Chris, did you want to just add something there? I was about to say, I've seen some people sort of make us, uh, we do actually, as I said, we have a safe word in place at all times. We make that really clear before, both in our packs that go out to players and at our safety briefing at the start of the and game. And in the rule set. Yeah, and in our rule set. Mm. I feel it's important to say that I think at every game we have had people who have used that word at some point in some capacity. People take that option and we create spaces deliberately away from the game area so they have no interaction with the game if they are in that position. We don't want people to feel like they are unable to leave an uncomfortable or difficult situation in that, in that case. Likewise, talking about trigger warnings, we've mentioned the survey that's come up and you may have gathered that it sounds to, sounds, may sound to you like some of these elements of this game, we, you know, we try to keep a degree of surprise, but sometimes we have surveys that come through that are very clear that the person attending would not enjoy this event, that they would not probably enjoy the themes and topics that are going to come up. We believe in transparency at that point. We believe in getting contact with people who would be our attendees and, and warning them in advance that this would probably be, these are the topics that are going to come up. Yes, it's supposed to be a surprise, but transparency is also vitally important where we think you would not be safe or you would not have a good time. And we're very open about that, but we also try to keep a degree of surprise for those attendees who want that surprise. It is a difficult balance. And I think one of the things that we acknowledge as a game team is we're always learning about how to make our games as accessible and as safe as possible for our attendees, whether that's for before the end or for a fantasy game. And we're not the only system who does that as well. Um, I myself has been have been turned away. Well, not turned away, but have been told um, this thing, this game is probably not for you. And I kind of went, yeah, you're probably right, actually. Um, and uh, it can be a moment of, oh, but then you kind of go, but it is for my own safety. And actually, I'm going to go play this game over here. And and when my friends came back and told me some of the themes, it was like, yeah, OK, that that was for my my benefit in some ways. So uh, in quite a lot of ways. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's one of those uh, important aspects, uh, making sure that folk are safe. Absolutely. So um, hopefully we'll be able to circle back around to that and uh, add some more comments in later questions. But um, we have really maxed out our time on our slot. Yeah, so we have. It's time to pass <laughs> over to Hazel. Um, so thanks, Chris and Lorraine, for uh, your contributions to the presentation. And I will um, hush myself. Um, and pass over to Hazel. So uh, Hazel is a, a researcher and designer from Open Lab at Newcastle University with research focusing on embodiment, playful design and co-creation uh, for the delivery of sex and relationship education. Um, so she's going to be uh, telling us a little bit about uh, embodied games, and I understand specifically in relation to escape rooms. Uh, so Hazel, uh, would you like to share your screen? Is there anything that you wanted to put on there? I would like Thank to share you. my screen. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we, can, we can see that, so it's all working. Well done. Perfect. We got there. Hello, everyone. Uh, as wonderfully introduced, uh, my name is Hazel. Uh, I'm from Open Lab in Newcastle University, which is the Human Computer Interaction Department at Newcastle. I use both they and she pronouns, both are fantastic. And you can find my Twitter or at the bottom, which is at NIMIM, if you fancy following me. So a little bit about me. I'm a PhD researcher. My role is around sort of playful, immersive uh, experiences, the sort of role of the body as well. 
uh, at play in sex and relationship education. I also uh, um, had a previous life and probably a current life uh, as an escape room and LARP designer. You can see on the right, that's me. Just in case you, you, you hadn't seen what I look like. I'm there, I've got very short brown hair that's curly, I'm white, I'm holding a lute, I'm sat by a lock um, on a beach in Scotland. Uh, so I just want to show you some pictures of some of the things that I do. Uh, this is a picture of an online LARP that I was doing during lockdown. These are people, they're all in the same place in the game, but they are remotely located in real life. Lots of people have used um, images from Oliver Facey and you can see him right at the very top in the middle. So this is on Discord and you can see a number of faces all in sort of cyberpunk um, gear. And here is an escape room. And I did, this was created for the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent. Uh, they had a certain learning objectives that they wanted to put forward uh, through their Challenge 2030 idea, and they wanted an immersive game uh, to build around it. And so we built an escape room all around about their uh, project and took it to um, the IRFRC convention in Geneva. So what do I mean when I'm talking about embodiments specifically in games? So embodiment in general looks at the way we experience things through our body, the ways that our body, our sensory, sensory motor, motor processing and our morphology are intrinsically related to the way that we perceive, understand, process the world. In embodied games, and I'm thinking of anything, things like LARPs, escape rooms, lots of live immersive games do this, sort of spawning from immersive theatre, a lot of the time you are embodying your character. You are taking on your character. Uh, your experience, uh, you experience the world and the game as your character. Uh, so on the right, you can see another picture of an online lap I did called the Nautical Trench. You can see a bunch of different uh, Discord names and a bunch of different rooms um, the, where the players would travel around these Discord rooms as if they were on a submarine. And that submarine was headed to a, an awful disaster. Um, some people uh, have argued to me that these are not examples of embodied games. These are not examples of LARPs because you're not interacting with other people as your character. You're, interacted, you're interacting mediated through a computer screen. I disagree with that. I take on the, the view that a lot of what we do um, in these sort of embodied games are ways where we take on our character and we interact with the world as our character. However, that's not the discussion that uh, we're having today. But I would be more than happy to discuss that in the future. Yeah. However, because you and your character or you and your role, um, in the case of certain, sometimes escape rooms and live immersive games, are so closely related, you share the same body you are very closely located to the narrative within these instances. And this incredibly close relation to the narrative, to the story, to the themes, is what drove me to exploring embodied games within education. However, I also ended up working within sex and relationship education. Uh, I started by volunteering, delivering sex education classes, and this spurned into an interest about what does it mean to deliver sex education? A lot of what we do at the moment, it, even with the new statutory guidance that's come in, is still very top down, telling uh, young people, you know, make sure you learn these eight STIs and the five symptoms and the four contraceptions that you can help prevent that to you. It's very knowledge based, uh, very top down. What do you need to know? Sex education broadly looks at how we promote learning about sex, sexuality, relationships, reproductive health, the decisions and understandings you have around these topic areas. Uh, and it is um, statutory now. And I'm definitely not the first person to understand it in a playful, immersive way. The game All Options by John Cole and Kelly Vander is an edulart 
an educational lark that explores um, abortions, abortion access, what it means. There are other uh, LARPs that explore similar sort of themes. The hashtag feminism anthology looks at different ideas around feminisms. Susanna Bejemo wrote Sumama so made a sex tape, which explores gender relations in families and sexuality and coming of age. So I ended up working on a project. And in this project, I worked with two stakeholders in Newcastle, the city where I'm based, who were involved in sexual health in the city. Together, we co-designed escape rooms that fit in their sex and relationship program. The first one was a charity based, uh, a children's charity, and I was working with social workers who were already going into schools, delivering sex education programs, mainly around sex and uh, healthy relationships, power and control and grooming. I didn't put this in here, but the, the young people, the children were approximately age 11 to 12. Uh, the second charity we designed with, we worked with young people, 18 to 21 year olds in a charity that looked at sexual health, things like STIs, contraception and healthy relationships. How do you construct an escape room? So when you're doing an educational escape room, step zero is you establish the learning objectives. At times, you already know those learning objectives. So when I was working the IFRC, they came to us with learning objectives. When I worked with the first um, charity, they had established uh, learning objectives that we drilled down as part of the co-design process. Then I go on to the more standard uh, escape room design process. The first thing I look at is I go, what is the environment? What is the setting? Uh, what, and then I think about what we might find in this environment. This helps to get an understanding for what is in the space, what elements you find, what can you use for later? How do we construct this space? An escape room being this sort of immersive environment where you are solving puzzles in order to escape, sometimes you need to figure out what your space, what your environment looks like. Step two, uh, we establish who are the players. What is it they're doing? Why is what they're doing important? This helps to construct the story and get people to be, to have a role in that story. Step three, uh, look at how we can mesh those elements together to create a story within the escape room uh, period um, where you can follow it through. Uh, you can go through puzzles or tasks um, in order to achieve your goal. Escape rooms are largely a series of tasks and puzzles that help you get through the narrative. Um, yeah, so what puzzles did we end up putting in these escape rooms? I'm gonna focus on two. One of them was, oh no, sorry, I put that in the stories. The stories, story one, Ben has gone missing. You need to look through his bedroom to find clues and get into his laptop to find out where he's gone. Uh, so the goal of the story was, um, find where Ben has gone and you were playing his friends. Story two, the slightly older young people, uh, you got drunk last night and woke up in a weird, weird bedroom. You need to find, figure out what's happened and then escape out the window without being noticed. We had some great little puzzles. Uh, we had a series of glasses with lipstick stains on. You had to go through social media to figure out who matched up uh, the lipstick things to the social media um, profile pictures to figure out uh, who, which glasses had been spiked that night. Um, and we talked, that had the aim of talking about drink spiking, what it meant, things like that. Puzzle two, we had a series of statements uh, about Harry, um, Harry and Ben's relationship, that's meant to say, uh, they would say things like, Harry gets angry when Ben doesn't uh, show him his uh, phone so he can check through the messages. And these statements about the relationships had to be sorted into three piles. When Joe, uh, Ben had all the power in the relationship, when Harry does, and when it's equal. equal. That gives a three digit code that helps to unlock a box. However, actually what we weren't trying to do was 
um, make an escape from and figure out how successful it would be. What we were trying to do was explore sex education, was explore embodiment and how co-design helped us find out some of these things. So we didn't find out what was successful, but we did find out some interesting things. The first one is risk, and I'm gonna expand more on risk in a bit, because risk was seen as both a problem that you have to stop young people doing risks, but also as a, um, as a benefit, what it means to have such engaged, embodied and active involvement. We talked a lot about identity um, in the co-design sessions, how we represented different identities and what it meant to get full integration and involvement in the story and how that would affect young people engaging with the story. We also talked about mediation through technology, what it means um, when young people's lives are now very heavily mediated through technology as well as relationships and how we let content recognise this. Sadly, we don't have enough time for those last two things, but I want to talk a little bit about risk because risk is very exciting to games, because in sex education, a lot of the time, people want to prevent risk at any, any possible way. Young people are taught, like, oh, don't get pregnant because bad things will happen. Don't get an STI or bad things will happen. And a lot of sex education is built around, don't take risks or don't do things that are risky. Um, it was also seen as a problem and a necessary problem with embodied games. Embodied games were very closely related, as I said earlier, to the body. So they had more chance of being emotion, emotionally risky, that they would have an effect, and necessarily that effect would be a problem. Um, so we had a lot of discussion around what that meant. And I'll expand on that in a bit. Um, however, risk was also seen as a key benefit of these very embodied games. There was an excitement of being immersed in the narrative. Um, it made the games engaging. Um, and also it was seen as a way to push boundaries within the education um, and find learnings at the boundaries of the subject area. What it meant for young people to push those boundaries and learn by pushing those boundaries. So games also in general come up against risk and the benefits and, and the, um, yeah, the benefits of risk. So games have the potential to be incredibly emotionally and physically impactful. We learned that in the last um, presentation, we saw that, but that means they have the potential to cause emotional and physical harm. Um, and there's a lot of work being done. Uh, people like Kiana Shaw, uh, TTRPG Safety Toolkit, uh, people like um, Johanna Kolyanen, uh, who's done a lot of LARP safety design fun, um, fundamentals, looking at the ways that we can prioritise safety, emotional safety, physical safety within our games. Um, and this has had a great way to make sure that we can take those risks, that those risks are important, um, that they allow for games that are expansive and transformative, but that aren't going to have that incredibly negative, uh, harmful emotional and physical experience. Um, so yeah, looking at what does it mean to take risks and what does it mean to take risks that can be, um, that are in a controlled way and that can be transformative and that can be powerful. Um, and a lot of um, what we're looking at is Again, stuff that's already been talked about. The first thing you want to do is identify and plan for the risks. Figure out the content that you are going to have in the game. Have a way to communicate that content. Have a way to communicate your players to communicate to you what they can't do. Have a way for your players to communicate with other people how to be safe. Secondly, during the game, you're looking at what it means to create a magic circle to build one where you can create a held space. Um, that's through um, the ways that we control the space, the ways that we maintain the space, the responsibility as people organizing to hold the space, and then we close it afterwards. 
And then especially important in an educational game, we look at how we can debrief following the game, how we can reflect and how we can build on those, uh, understand the things that have happened during the game. Uh, in a, uh, an educational game, uh, when you're looking at experience, one of the things that can help turn experience into cognition is the ability to reflect on the themes that you've come across. Um, the ability to look at an educate, uh, a game around sex education, for example, understand the ways that you might have been talking about power and control in a relationship and how you can um, reflect that back on real life. Um, there's a lot of, when you're talking about these games, there's a lot of talking about how they can affect you as a person. Your character and your player are not two distinct people uh, and they will have different effects uh, on you. Uh, Janaya Kemper has done an amazing uh, bit of work on uh, weeding the self and about emancipatory bleed and what it means to experience uh, bleed the effect that a character might have on a player in a way that is transformative. Um, yeah, so finally, I want to talk about embodiment as a way of giving agency to people, especially within sex education, as I talked about, it's very top down, very diegetic. You're telling young people what to think. By giving uh, young people, especially the ability to have some understanding, some way to affect or be involved in the narrative, you're able to communicate that they have more power in that situation. Um, this isn't the only way, it shouldn't be the only way to give young people power over a situation, um, but it's something that is often taken away from them uh, because uh, it's often been the case that people who teach sex education are quite nervous about letting young people experience it. It means that, for example, um, talk a lot about consent and how sometimes when the only, when the first time you get to experience consent, experience having any say of your bodily autonomy is when you have sex, then you're experiencing having some say of your bodily autonomy or being able to give consent or understand consent too late in your education. And that's the way that we can understand building embodiment, giving young people the power uh, as a way to do sex education. So this is my, yeah, this is my big problem, uh, big understanding is how do you get players to take risks in games? Sometimes, uh, in different games, people talk about um, bottling when they mean I wanted to do something, but I stopped myself. I wanted to take a risk or do something that might hurt my reputation, hurt my um, hurt myself emotionally, and I wanted to do that, but something stopped me. Um, how do we do that? How do we create held, safe environments to do that? It's very interesting. Um, I had some final notes, which were mainly things that I was re thinking about in the morning um, and during the wonderful talks that have been happened so far um, and noted down. Some of them are, I don't, we don't yet have a good answer to what does it mean to measure these games, what it means to understand how sex education is measured, well, not under sex education, but some of these games. That's something I'm working on in my research, as well as like what it means to push boundaries in sex education, what it means to push against and how learning happens there. As well as that, the final thing is that embodiment is not the same for everyone. We all, we all have bodies, but they exist in a patriarchal heteronormative society and so often are treated differently. Um, I'm disabled. I sometimes think about how my body is seen as different to uh, other people, especially in the realm of sex education, when often disabled people are seen as, or oh, you don't want to think about them having sex. Um, again, that's something that I can talk about, but not right now. It's very interesting to think about 
what it means to have a different body in these educational environments. The very final thing I want to say is that there is a game jam coming up, a sex education game jam, um, which is for games designers and sex educators, either one, you can be either, um, to work together to learn how to make games around sex education. Perfect. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Hazel. Beautifully to time, most importantly. <laughs>